Well, good evening, friends. It's nice to see my screen populating with smiling faces. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Dave Schaub. I am the director of the Inland Northwest Land Conservancy, and uh, I just want to start off by thanking you all for uh, joining us for yet another Zoom meeting in your busy days. I assume that like uh, like the rest of us on the Inland Northwest Land Conservancy staff, um, the new norm in your days may be going from one Zoom meeting to the next. And uh, so we're grateful to you for joining us for another one. And uh, we hope that you'll find it interesting and educational and maybe even inspiring. I have you all on mute and, um, and that's intentional. Uh, there's nothing I'd love more than to go around the room and ask you all to introduce yourselves and say hello. Um, but we also are really committed to keeping this to the one hour that we advertised. And um, so if we have time at the end, maybe we'll, we'll open it up for uh, folks to say hello and, and introduce themselves. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Lena Bernstein. I'm gonna stop my screen share and um, say a few words about Lena. Lena is a, one of our board members and, uh, and serves on our internal affairs committee. She also serves on uh, our Appetite for Conservation fundraising committee our Appetite for Conservation is our annual fall gala, and it's, um, it's a very important fundraising event for us. We bring in about 15% of our uh, operating income for the year at that one event. And we've made the very hard decision with the committee's support to, um, to actually cancel that event for this year. And so the committee uh, did a great job of brainstorming ideas. How, are, how can we reach out to our community and engage folks uh, in, in lieu of uh, being able to gather in person. And so this Zoom, for, Zoom with a view idea was hatched at uh, that committee meeting. And, um, and so Lena has offered graciously to serve as our, uh, our grand convener and welcomer. So I'll hand it over to Lena and um, see if I can unmute her. Okay, Lena, you're live. Okay, and uh, I don't know that I'm gonna live up to that introduction, but I also promise that I'm not gonna actually do fundraising uh, on this uh, Zoom call. So um, I just thank you so much for you know being part of this experiment with us. Um, as soon as I'm done talking, my husband is gonna join me because he is a geology geek and very interested in hearing this presentation. Um, but I just wanna say that um, I have never really been happier or more proud to be part of this organization because I think all of us are experiencing the importance of nature right now. Um, I'm really lucky because I can walk out my back door and head out to the bluff trails and I can tell you that there are lots and lots of people who are taking advantage of that city park that is uh, the High Drive Bluff and um, the trails there. About, I'd say about five times as many people as I've ever seen before. And my husband and I know how many people are using the trails because there's a right of way right through our backyard or the very edge of our backyard. So we see firsthand how people are wanting to get out of their houses and enjoy our open public spaces. And I think, you know, this is an audience that can really appreciate the importance of nature as a place to find peace and solace and restoration in uh, strange times, like the ones that we're all going through together right now. So um, I'm uh, really happy that I'm part of this incredible organization and I can tell you that even though uh, we're not physically out on our community lands, our work is, uh, if, if anything, accelerating. I'm probably not the only board member who sometimes feels kind of dizzy with all the projects that we have going on. In fact, just in the last couple of weeks, we have closed uh, on protecting two pieces of 
beautiful private land in the Coeur d'Alene Basin. And it could take the rest of our hour if I started to name all the different projects that we're working on. But um, Dave, I certainly want to thank you and our amazing staff uh, for keeping uh, the faith during this time and can't wait till we're all back out uh, taking a hike in person with Todd Dunfield, who is our community conservation manager and um, who is uh, uh, trying to continue to bring you closer to the lands that we love, even while we can't actually be with Todd out walking on Rimrock to Riverside. So Todd, I am going to hand things over to you, but I really want to thank all of you so much, not only for uh, experimenting like this with us, but for your ongoing support for the Conservancy. Um, as a board member, it, it really means a lot to me. So thanks to each one of you and over to you, Todd. Thank you, Lena. I couldn't have said it better myself. Um, you know, it's a lot going on at the Conservancy right now. So tonight, uh, we have a seven minute video, a flying tour of the Rimrock to Riverside project area. So we get to be a bird and see, see these wonderful lands from the bird's eye view. But first, um, I would like to take a few minutes and uh, look at the overview map. So thanks for pulling that up, Dave. Um, as some of you are well aware of, R2R is a, the Rimrock to Riverside project is a 123 acre gap project. Uh, it's bridging a gap between two different parks. Um, and that would be Palisades Park to the south, which is about 700 acres, represented by kind of a lighter green, and Riverside State Park, which is about nine or 10,000 acres to the north. And our project area is represented by the orange properties there. And there's 10 different uh, parcels of land, and they all have the parcel lines drawn in. Uh, you can, the blue represents water on this map. There are some ponds uh, that some, some of the ponds dry up later in the season, but two of them usually stay uh, full of water. Um, we're trying to, to connect these two parks and once we're finished there will be an 11 mile corridor for wildlife and hopefully rec human recreation along the west uh, shores of the Little Spokane River and uh, we're, we're, we're pretty excited about that. Um, one last thing I'll say about the map uh, or now that's gone is that uh, the Spokane City Parks is uh, committed to, they've bought into the idea of, of assuming the ownership and long-term management of the 123 acres. Um, so Dave, if you would start the video now, um, we're going to be watching this together through YouTube and it had, the video has no sound, my talking will be the sound tonight. And I want to thank both Tom Kessler and Rose Richardson for going out in the field with me just last Friday and capturing this footage on a beautiful blue sky, white puffy cloud day. So this rocky area uh, is uh, part of the usual and accustomed lands of the Spokane tribe of Indians. And uh, it's important because Chief Gary himself lived out his final days on the south end of Palisades Park in a, in a kind of a campsite that he had built. Um, this old wooden fence post you'll notice has the rocks piled up along the bottom of it. It's because the, the ground here is often, it's almost completely basalt and it's impenetrable. You really can't put a tee post or a wooden fence post in the ground. So the, the early homesteaders and people had to pile rocks along the bottom of their fence posts. Hmm. Maps of the early 1900s in this area show plats for roads and houses and, and even a small college it looked like. Um, but none of those things were ever built. Uh, instead, the Olmsted brothers uh, designated these lands as uh, part of their Olmsted Park plan. And so uh, in that plan, the roadway you see in this flyover right now is Rimrock Drive. And that was a parkway that they suggested to the city that they should incorporate in their, their 1907 park plan. And indeed, it became part of the finalized plan and it was built. There's some beautiful rock arches, uh, very kind of Conservation Corps era looking um, structures that are part of this, this road. And the road is built out to offer some of the best views of downtown Spokane. Uh, it's a great place to walk now because it's flat and it's, it's accessible to a lot of, of different types of people. Um, you'll see some arrow leaf balsam root uh, that just last Friday, they were, they were near what I would call peak bloom. Uh, there's, there's a lot of, uh, of flowers out there to go look at. Um, so the past decade or so, 
uh, past few decades, I should say, Palisades Park has been slowly growing. It's been adding a, a few more acres here and another dozen acres there because of the tenacious work of conservation heroes like Vic and Robbie Castleberry and others. Uh, that's how the park has grown to its current size of 700 acres. Um, one persistent gap has remained and that's our projects, project site. So it's, it's a long-term vision of the community, the neighbors around this, these, these lands, and they came to us, which is a common story of la our land conservation efforts. We're approached by the neighbors and people who've been working and thinking about this for years. Um, and just this spring, as I've gone out to check on the flowers and to look over the property, I'm amazed at the amount of people who've been using these trails and this property to, to recreate during the stay safe, stay home uh, order by Governor Jay Inslee. Uh, a number of people have been recreating all over Palisades Park, including along this, this north section of Rimrock Drive. Um, sorry, the, if the video is a little glitchy for you, you can also find the same YouTube video on our home on our, our website under conservation news if you click on that tab but it's working pretty well for me hopefully you're you're getting the the gist of being a bird and flying through the trees with me right now so the you'll see in a second but the the western quarter or fifth of the property burnt in 2015 so there are some fire scars in the land but the foliage and, and uh, the land is coming back um, i'm going to talk a little bit of geology. So in the picture right now, straight ahead, you see a rock outcropping, kind of a cliff. Now it's going out of the frame to the left. I think Nigel might talk a little bit about that later on. So I wanted to point that out. And I'd also like to hook up, point to those trails down below to the right, that a number of these trails have been used for, for decades. Um, people riding their horses, neighbors going for, for runs and, and jogs. Um, and these are the lands that now we're you know, stewarding, we're coming up with the trail plan for. So uh, there are no buildings on the property, but there are some leftover barbed wire fences and things. And we've been uh, getting to, when we could get together in large groups, we were hosting service projects out on the property to remove the barbed wire and generally clean it up for the public. So I would like to just kind of come out tonight and let everybody know it's currently not open for public recreation use, but we are we're working up to that. We are, we've worked with parks to improve the parking area, move some boulders around and make a better, made a better parking area. We're also continuing to remove the barbed wire. Um, so it's, uh, here's some of the ponds. I love showing the, the ponds off. Um, but there is abundant wildlife out on the land. Uh, it's not uncommon to, uncommon to come across 20 plus turkeys, uh, you know, just making a ruckus and going wherever they want out there. Uh, we often see deer and the occasional moose. Uh, one neighbor thought they, they had counted up upwards of four or five moose this spring, all individual moose, not the same moose over and over again. Um, but I like some of the little critters out there. Uh, I've come across porcupine. Um, and one of my favorite little critters is a skink. It's a small little kind of um, neon tail lizard that is no more than two or three inches. Uh, the Western skink uh, I, I found out here one night, which was, which was pretty special. As you heard in the video coming in, this is a home to a lot of birds, songbirds, um, mallards, ducks use these ponds. Um, I'm yet to see a great you know, blue heron or anything like that yet, but uh, who knows, one could move in tomorrow. So uh, yeah, during Rose Richardson and I have been doing regular monitoring visits out to the land to, to check on it and pick up trash and, and you know generally keep a good eye on what's been going on out there. Um, and it's, uh, it's really a special place to go. Some of our staff uh, took time to, to go do a, a, a 10 minute sit in nature kind of contemplative uh, time. And we, many of us chose to go out here. There are turkeys in this shot those two black dots off to the left are turkeys and one of them just puffed up in the video um, unaware of what the drone exactly was. I think it got a little got a little afraid of what uh, what might be coming out of the sky at it. Um, I love the old fence line, the decrepit fence that you see there. The wire has all been pulled off but uh, remnants of the you know, old homesteaders and people who tried to run cattle on the land. And here this shot is really the money shot. We're coming to Rimrock the edge of the Palisades. We're looking back into Spokane, our, our own community. Um, and it's just a wonderful place. Uh, it's right out of almost everyone's backyard. So thank you so much for being a bird with me and coming along on that, uh, that tour of, of the lands we're working to protect. 
So I have the, the great honor of getting to introduce a friend of mine uh, up next. Why everybody's really on this call is to learn about geology. Uh, you know, it's fun to be a bird and listen to me, but it's even more fun to learn about the rock under our feet. So Mr. Nigel Davies is a faculty member at the geology department out at Eastern Washington University. Um, and he and I once uh, commiserated that we both have similar jobs where we help people to find a greater sense of place, you know, their own backyard. We reintroduce them to, to the rocks and the geology and, and the trees and the natural history. Um, and that, that fills both of our, our souls immensely. So um, you can often find Nigel out on a bike, whether it be recreational riding like he was about an hour, hour and a half ago, or sometimes racing bikes uh, through the mud, you know, cycle cross, those sorts of things. Um, and he's been really generous with his time with us, uh, with the Conservancy over the years, uh, co-leading hikes with myself. And Jack Nisbet loves to have Nigel come along because we start talking about the natural history and then the questions start flying about the rocks and the geology and the hydrology. And uh, that's where Nigel comes in, it's just indispensable. So thank you so much, Nigel, for all your time prepping for tonight. And uh, yeah, take it away from there. Great. Fantastic. Well, I thank you all for being here. Uh, I've actually not done a Zoom call where people show up, so my students uh, uh, don't uh, don't show up to class uh, via Zoom. Uh, so we're all as asynchronous right now, so it's really nice just to see faces uh, during one of these. But um, yeah, my goal is to just kind of give you a, a lay of the land and, and make sure that, that you're all comfortable with what the backstory of not only the geology of Spokane, but a little bit about the geology of Washington. Um, I work with uh, Craig Goodwin quite a bit. Uh, he's a friend, so you'll see a, quite a few of his, um, his photos sprinkled throughout here. Um, but I've done, oop, yeah. I don't know if I've got control yet. Oh, there we go. There we go. So I've, uh, we did a nice walk uh, last year out uh, with um, the INLC. Oop, yeah, we're going, I see what's going on here. Can you go back one, Dave? Sorry, I feel like I've lost control. It's one of those, yeah, now we're going forward. Sorry. Um, so last one where we we did a we did a hike out uh, with the INLC. Uh, we had about 15 people out and uh, some very interested uh, youthful members of society uh, learning about uh, the basalt stratigraphy as well as the flood story. So we titled this today the uh, fill, rinse, uh, scour, and repeat um, because that's really what's happened to the Columbia Basin over the last 20 million years. Um, and so I, I got to keep my dog at bay here. Um, all right, let's see. So I don't know if I've lost control. Um, the, uh, the geology at, uh, in and around uh, the, can we forward one more, Dave? Um, the geology in and around uh, Rimrock to Riverside uh, hinges on, uh, and you'll see, hopefully uh, this is a, uh, Hillshade DEM, uh, it's actually a bit of LIDAR uh, imagery, um, focuses on uh, the basalt uh, and obviously the, the, the unconsolidated deposits that are in and around the river. Um, and that that's represents the flood. Uh, some of the features that pull out, um, you know, Todd alluded to that weird uh, kind of uh, high point uh, uh, that is uh, a bit of eroded basalt, uh, and it sticks out beautifully in the LIDAR images. Um, but just so that everyone has a bit of the lay of the land, uh, right, we've got uh, the features of the high ridge of Palisades linking in, uh, going down across Government Way onto multiple plateaus of both basalt and gravel as you move northward into Riverside State Park. Uh, one of the other things that comes out really well when you zoom in on the LIDAR and you can see them all around this little feature that's pulled out are these little Mima mounds, uh, which have a variety of Genesis stories. Um, some believe they are flood features. Some believe that they are seismically induced. Um, these are the ones that are located down and around the 
uh, just south of the Capitol Forest uh, over in Olympia at Mima Mound State Park, um, evenly spaced gravel gravel mounds. Um, I, I don't hesitate to guess uh, exactly what the origin is here, uh, but they are they do stick out and they are kind of they're elusive when you're walking out at Rimrock, um, but they come out really nicely in the uh, in the lidar. So hopefully we go one forward. Uh, I don't know if I've quite got the control that I should have had, but. Uh, all right, perfect. I, I do really recommend that um, uh, you grab uh, that you grab the, the app Rocked on your phone. Um, it's it's a equivalent to a, a program called MacroStrat, and um, just like when whenever I'm out, I have that, and it tells you exactly what's underneath your feet, um, which is really nice to know. Uh, but we've got a variety of different basalt flows. Um, in, in and around the Spokane area, we have two main units of the Columbia River basalts. The Grand Ronde uh, down below uh, is the most voluminous uh, of the two basalt flows. And then on top of that, we have a thin capping uh, of the Wanapum basalt. And so when you're downtown in the, at the falls, uh, that is the Grand Ronde. You're, you're far enough down in the section. But as we've moved up onto the West Plains, we end up on, into the, the, the Wanapum. Uh, so most of the park is actually held, especially Rimrock, is held in the Wanapum. And all of the, the conservation lands that uh, Todd alluded to are all in Wanapum and have been scoured by uh, the flood material. And then down in the valley, we have uh, all of those beautiful flood gravels, as well as some landslide features where the edge of the cliff has kind of slid uh, kind of to the northeast um, as a result of likely faulting on the, potentially faulting on the Hangman, Hangman Litoff Fault or uh, just being slumped into the river uh, as a result of being undercut by floods. So we've got a little bit of landslide debris um, that uh, rims the outside of the cliff features. So next slide if possible. And I feel like I don't have as good a control as I could have had. All right. So this is, this is, a, this is a great little lesson for I hope that everyone can take away today. Um, the geology of Washington, we happen to live on what was the old edge of Washington, uh, of, of North America. And as you move progressively westward from Spokane, the material in Washington gets older and, uh, sorry, younger and younger and younger. They are a series of what we call accreted terrains. Uh, so they got smushed on. Imagine you can subduct off the western margin an island arc that looks like Japan today. And so they rammed Japan onto the western margin. And every time this happened, uh, J the North America got just a little bit bigger. And the final of final terrain that was accreted is the materials that are in and around the Olympic Peninsula. So you can think about going all the way west and the last thing that gets added on are the basalts that were once ocean floor out there at the far western edge uh, of Washington. They were once on the ocean floor and now they've been smushed or accreted onto that margin. So all of this to say is everything got punctuate, punctured uh, about 17 million years ago by the intrusion of these Columbia River basalts and Eastern, the Columbia Basin is completely covered by those. All right, so hopefully that gives you. I really also recommend if anyone, if anyone wants to go around uh, this book, Marley Miller, G Roadside Geology of uh, of Washington. It's a lifesaver when I've forgotten exactly what's in exactly the right place. So I do recommend grabbing that. Uh, Marley Miller, Daryl Cowan, it's fantastic. All right, hopefully we move forward. Oh yeah, look at that. So if we were to drill down, and they did try this uh, underneath basically the bridges, uh, the high, at High Bridge Park, if anyone, hopefully people are familiar, that's the, the divide between Palisades and the Bluff. Um, they tried to drill an oil well down into the really, really old rock. Uh, 
yeah, they didn't get any oil um, because there was no organic life uh, to be found uh, 1.5 billion years ago. Um, but the uh, we split apart from Australia and Antarctica about 1.5 million year billion years ago, and the material that was in there got filled in, and as we rifted open the basin. We filled in that valley, and, and that's the material that makes up the rocks of Glacier, but also makes up the subsurface, this material way, 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 way down that has subsequently been intruded by lots of different granites. So if we were to able to drill down below all the basalt, we would find some of this probably Pritchard Valley formation that is part of the belt supergroup. So that's... That's the very bottom of the section. And now we're gonna move chronologically up and eventually we'll get to those basalts. All right. So we, as all those terrains were being added on to the Western margin, we have granites that get intruded. Um, some at Willow Lake that are really young, um, something like 45 million years old, and some out at Mount Spokane that were upwards of 100 million years old. Uh, so when you look out and you see places like Beacon Hill, Beacon Hill is a, a spot where the basalt or the, the granites have pushed through those older sedimentary rocks and those older sedimentary rocks have been myelatinized or uh, sheared uh, and metamorphosed. Uh, and so oftentimes the old, old belt supergroup gets metamorphosed by these granite intrusions. Again, great photos of by Mount, uh, Craig Goodwin. James Richmond is another fa uh, fan favorite of uh, these projects. And if you want uh, a little spot to go out to, Willow Lake, which is one of the four lakes uh, off of the I-90 exit, uh, there's some granites and some really beautiful shelite mineralization at the top of one of those gr um, big uh, intrusions. So it's like mineralization as a result of cooking. So as we move forward in time, again, we're going up in stratigraphy. Uh, we're going to, hopefully, oh yeah. Yes, we're going to move on to the Columbia River basalts. And a uh, recently published uh, paper came out and we've had this big, big wide range and you'll hear this range, this 17 million years to about 6 million years. Well. I want to tell you right now that the stuff that's here in Spokane is about 16.7, 16.5 million years old. So that puts it directly in the in Miocene. Um, and the Grand Ronde, again, is the, the most voluminous of those. This is a combination of the, the tectonics where as you start to have subduction off the western margin of North America, you also have a little bit of extension. And by combination of that extension and the hotspot that's tracking from into uh, currently uh, underneath Yellowstone, um, we have the ability to have this progressively northward driving set of fractures that allow basaltic lavas to get erupted into the Columbia River Basin. And they do so it basically like how we would see lava flows in Hawaii, but they fill and then spread out laterally. And so when we look out and you can see, if, you, if you're out in, at Riverside State Park at the Bowl and Pitcher Overlook on the south side, and you look behind you, you'll see these big layers of basalt. And that's filled and expanded outwards from one fissure one crack in the earth. And those cracks are orientated approximately northwest, southeast. So, all right. So there's dry falls and you can see many of the, the layers right there. And again, there are many of these basalt flows. We are mainly working in Eastern, in our little nook at Rimrock to Riverside in the Grand Ronde and the capping rock, which is the Wanapum. And if you go out to other localities, this is at Frenchman Cooley, uh, right by the Columbia River Basin. Uh, this is more Wanapum, uh, the Frenchman Springs member. So there's different flows. Sometimes those flows interfingered with each other. 
So they were synchronous with each other. In academia, everybody now knows what the word synchronous is because we've all learned what asynchronous is also about. Um, and if any of you have kids, I'm sure you have learned about that as well. Um, so it's kind of fun. I hope that logarithmic scales also become a thing too. Um, we'll see. We'll see how people uh, pick onto these things. So the again, recently, um, hopefully this this will play. Um, my colleague, uh, Chad Pritchard, just recently published a, a really fascinating paper about the, um, the PFOS uh, chemical intrusion, uh, chemicals, the forever chemicals that are held in the, um, the different paleo channels on the West Plains. So these were channels that existed before the floods came. So they were carved down into the basalts. And there you can see the combination of the wanapum on top of the Grand Ronde. There are actually multiple different flows of Grand Ronde uh, located in here. Uh, the Sentinel Bluffs is the cap member. Um, down below it is that Wapshila Ridge. So if anybody does live up there, I know a lot of the wells are drilled down into uh, the Grand Ronde. Um, anytime you can avoid drilling into the topmost portion of a um, of an aquifer, you you can get much cleaner uh, water. So you're you if you're out there and you're drinking that water, you might be drinking water that fell 16 million years ago and got incorporated into the pore space of the basalt and has been hanging out down there for 16 million years. Now there are times where we see infiltration um, of certain of water down in current meteoric water falling in there, um, but we started to look at where those paleo channels are and this also helps put in perspective because once we get out to the very edge, to the eastern edge, this is where we're getting to where Rimrock to Riverside is as we go further west, we would go back towards Airway Heights and also out to Fairchild Air Force Base, which was one of the sources of the PFOS chemicals that got intruded, uh, that got put into the into the aquifer. Hopefully, this play, and you can hopefully kind of see this inflation. Uh, maybe not. It doesn't look very happy. Maybe we should go to the next slide. Yeah. All right. This is the scour event. So we filled up all of the valley. And, and this, is, this is something to really think about is that there would have been rivers. The Spokane River probably would have been existed there uh, when we had the floods. But because there was already fractures in that northwest, southeast manner. But the floods then come and carve and take away much of the basalt that was filling up. So when you stand at Rimrock to Riverside and you look out to Five Mile Prairie, you can imagine, you can see a layer of basalt out at Five Mile Prairie. And from there, you can extrapolate that from lateral continuity, the basalt would have filled up that entire valley and has now been scoured when the floods come zooming on through. So we, pe we reach um, maximum gla glacial maximum about eight, uh, 18,000 years ago. And by that time, the Purcell Trench is uh, blocking off Glacial Lake Missoula. Um, the Okanagan Lobe has not formed uh, and some of these other Columbia River Lobes are not in place yet. So the first set of floods actually rips all the way down through what is the current Columbia River down past Wenatchee. And they pond it these places like Wallula Gap creating some of the glacial lakes that take a longer time to actually have the water exit. Then as the glaciers grow and the Okanagan lobe gets emplaced, we have progressive incision of the channeled scablands eastward. So th this is a really important concept. You, you look at a map like this and, and I, I think a lot of people are there to think, well, it flooded everything at the exact same time. And 
there's just no way for that amount of water, even though there was plenty of water, there's no way for it to do all of that work in one shot. Uh, so this was progressive incision, and it was directedly pro progressive incision. So as the Okanagan lobe grows, we allow waters to get further east as part of this flooding. And then eventually, they, we fill up the what's called Glacial Lake Columbia, and that then uh, overtops its banks. So we would have been standing at Rimrock to Riverside, potentially with you know, 100 feet of water, 50 feet of water over our heads because we were backed up in a glacial lake. Um, and you can still find many of those glacial lake deposits down along the South Hill Bluffs and further south along Hangman Creek. Hopefully this moves forward. Uh, yeah, there we go. So this is kind of, a, this is out of a Myers at all paper. You, you can see we fill up the lake in Hangman Creek. Uh, we uh, evacuate it, so we fill it up with gravels to start with. We then uh, have it ripped through by another flood. We fill it up with lake material, uh, so we have lake sediments in there. And then we have it uh, evacuated and a final batch of gravels filled in. And then importantly is that all of those gravels are loosely held and they start slumping and sliding. And you can see this is a this is Jerry White who is our river keeper's worst nightmare right here, um, is all of the uh, s sediment being fluxed off the hill slopes, not only south along Hangman Creek, but uh, all through, um, all along the, the walls of Hangman Creek, f flooding down into the Spokane River, where Lataw Creek overwhelms the clean Spokane River right there. That was a couple of winters ago, a couple of Februarys ago that that occurred. Uh, hopefully we're moving forward. Yeah, and this gives us the aquifer. So one of the things that's really important about all these big floods is that they leave behind a whole bunch of gravels and Spokane would not be what it is without its really fantastic, highly productive aquifer. Uh, and those, some of the gravels are upwards of 300 feet deep um, as you move further east. Uh, and you can see all of this. You can look out from Rimrock to Riverside to see the gravel, to see the flat Spokane Valley. And, and that was flattened and filled in during probably some of the final floods. Uh, there were upwards of 80 to 100 uh, individual pulses of water uh, coming out of Glacial Lake Missoula. But this is really key to the to the story is that the valley fills up with those um, materials. And then I, I can't help but add this in there. I'm not quite sure how zoomed in we got, but um, the uh, we're coming up on the 40th anniversary of uh, Mount Mount St. Helens eruption. Um, probably many of you remember that day. I was not alive, um, but uh, that's all right. I, I came a couple of, I came a year later. Um, but if you go out to um, if you're driving up on the uh, on Sunset Highway, or no, sorry, not on Sunset Highway, on uh, on I-90, uh, right at the top of the Sunset Hill, you will see this white uh, mass. This is not ash from Mount St. Helens; rather, it is ash from Crater Lakes Mount Mazama. And so, sprinkled out throughout Rimrock to Riverside are likely little pockets, little places that got scoured by the floods wa washing over, and have some of this uh, Mazama ash inside them. And so we, we might be able to go down and have a look at the bottom of some of those uh, little wetlands. If you were able to core down into that wetland, you would likely find a whole bunch of this Mazama ash, which normally when it's still wet, looks very orange. So that's kind of a, a fun backstory. Sorry, this slide's kind of all, I'm not quite sure what happened there. Ah, so finally, I, I'll just sum up our uh, little bit of the geology of the area, um, and then I'll, I'll open up the story to questions, and I've got a couple that I, I want get, to get to, um, but just kind of walk through. So we've got that Mazama and, and the St. Helens. The St. Helens event is like a couple of centimeters of it, ash at the top. Mount Mazama, uh, completely different scale, um, upwards of, I think, something like, uh, 20 cubic kilometers versus the 0.25 cubic kilometers of material erupted. Um, 
So and we've got those ICH floods. Again, progressive incision as we have Glacial Lake Missoula form and also the Glacial Lake, uh, Glacial Lake, oh, the uh, Glacial Lake Columbia form behind the Okanagan. I didn't talk about the Palouse formation, but it's in there somewhere. And I didn't talk about the Leita formation, but it, it in, interfingers with the, the basalts. And there's some great spots, especially along the Fish Lake Trail, to see that. So as we continue backwards in time, remember we've got those granitic intrusions that push and pulsate through all of the uh, really, really old um, uh, belt supergroup, which is the the final part of our story, 1.5 to, um, and some some of the sediments are as young as 700 million years old, if you want to call something young at 700 million years old. <laughs> so, there's our story. Um, yeah, I, I felt like I should throw a sandstone uh, uh, final final thing in there, just because we don't have any around here. Um, but yeah, I'm more than happy to to take questions. Um, and uh, so one, one of the things uh, that I, 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 hate, I wish my students did, uh, I really wish they'd throw questions into the chat. So if, if you have questions and you're more than welcome to, we'll open up the floor, but more than welcome to just throw a question into the chat as well. Thank you so much, Nigel. I, every, I've heard your presentations before and with the visuals tonight, I learned a few new things. Um, when people registered for tonight's Zoom chat, they uh, send in a few questions and I have some prepared here. So why don't I just kick us off by asking the first one and uh, get us going. Um, the question is, what's cool about the geology at Maribu Point out in the Spokane Valley? Um, and there's a second part, but uh, I'll ask that after you answer. What's going on out there at Maribu? Okay, so Maribu, uh, Maribu is the, a spot where you can, it's like Maribu Springs. Uh, there's a YMCA there. If anyone's not familiar, it's on the Centennial Trail. Uh, this is a point that would have stuck up during the flood. So it, it was slightly more resistive. Uh, it's a whole bunch of gneisses, uh, very similar to the, the geology of Beacon, uh, Beacon Hill. And so there's, you've got, you're on the verge of between granite and stuff that granite was cooking um, as it intruded, but it would have stuck out um, as, during the floods and the flood, the, the base of the flood waters would have rafted around it and it basically got filled up with gravel, but that little point just still stuck out. So one thing that's really important is to think that there was paleo topography when we filled in with the basalt. Uh, and similarly, there's paleo topography and little pinnacles that stuck out when the gravels uh, washed through the Spokane Valley. So yeah, it's a cool little spot where you can get like, you have window into the old, old past. And the second part of that question is, whatever happened to this uh, idea of an Ice Age floods trail? Do you know where that's at? Yeah, uh, there's a variety of the, we had the, I had met the people from the national park um, that they, they, it's kind of stalled out right now and their website is not, um, not updated. Um, so I think there's some people from the uh, Ice Age Flood Institute working to kind of figure out where there's a good stopping point, um, but that it's, it's in the works, um, but it has not come together yet. Um, so I think right. that's a stay tuned for Yeah, maybe, maybe someday. I think we have time yeah. for one more short question. And then we've got a message for Dave, I think, to, to wrap this up. We want to uh, be mindful of everyone's time and, uh, and, and in this before 8 p.m. if possible. Um, the next question is a great what if. I, I, it's not just my kids who ask what if questions, and, and they're really great. Um, what if the Ice Age floods didn't happen? What would Rimrock Riverside look like then? So... You certainly wouldn't have the Mima Mounds on the top. Um, that, that's definitely, I, I think, something glacial, and you need the sediment up there. Um, we, would, we would have had much taller uh, basalt. Uh, there would have been more of the basalt um, left over because it got scoured away. Uh, and, but the, the river would still be there. Um, it might be such that the river was running in the basalt, uh, a little bit higher and not in the gravels. Um, there may not be as many gravels there. Um, but yeah, that's, it's a, it's a fat, I, there may, may be connection between Rimrock to Riverside. Uh, 
the the valley that is where Government Way uh, runs might not have, might not be there. Um, but uh, yeah, we would have just we would have been a lot higher up because uh, we we lost a lot of basalt uh, during the flood, uh, and that that that's that's the one thing I can say is that we would have had our river system would have had a lot more residual basalt lining it. Whereas today we have eroded, and especially that gets back to that Mirabu Point question, we've eroded through the basalt in the Spokane Valley to expose the rock that is down below. So that's, that's my take. Uh, we would still have a river um, and uh, the, the Hangman Creek would still be there. Um, we probably would have some Palouse soils on top as well um, because the glaciation would still have happened. And it's highly likely, in my opinion, that we had glaciations that came further south in more, more a, a, lo a longer period of time ago in previous glaciations than to the last uh, maxim glacial maximum um, known as like, I won't talk about that part. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I'll leave Do we have there. time for one more question? Do you think? Yeah, I think so. Um, anyone? This is anyone, one. Go ahead. Oh, uh, we have one more prepared, but if somebody else wants to write one in the chat, I just checked the chat and I didn't see a new type question. Um, this is one you might have to rein yourself in on, Nigel. Um, and it's, how does the modern understanding of the Ice Age flood support or not support Bretz's original theory? Um, and when was the last flood? So it's kind of a two-part question. But tell us who Bretz was and what his whole role in this was. Yeah, J. J. Harlan Bretz uh, was a... Uh, teacher from a uh, professor from uh, Chicago actually uh, who came out and uh, did mu most of the the legwork to understand the Scavlan flood flooding story and he only came up with one flood um and he he was pushed back upon because catastrophism was not uh was not big in the world of geology um and he didn't have a really good source but one of the things we always like to talk about in science is as a mechanism and making sure that you understand the mechanism for why something has happened. And he didn't have the mechanism for delivering the water. Um, but he was justified in the end. Uh, this was back in 1923, 25, when he did some of his initial studies. Um, and he had the ice a little bit too far south. Um, so it's been refined. Uh, and we actually have a map at Eastern's, on Eastern's campus that is the wrong the wrong interpretation, but he, he nailed the, the, the story of the floods. Uh, what he didn't anticipate were there being so many of the floods and that the, the dam at glacial, uh, at the Purcell Trench up in Sandpoint could heal itself and allow for it to rebuild glacial Lake Missoula and the rate at which it could rebuild glacial Lake Missoula. So he didn't have the opportunity to see uh, to see the ashes that were from Mount St. Helens trapped in the lake sediments that were ponded behind uh, some of those lakes uh, as we get down to like Wallula Gap. Uh, so he didn't get to go everywhere, but he got he got the most of most the important part of that story correct. Um, and it's been left to other researchers uh, over time to fill in the nuanced details. Uh, and there's a re the recent study, uh, this Balbus et al. paper, which if you're interested, you can contact me directly, um, does a great job of telling that progressive incision story and not needing to have one massive flood, but having lots of small floods. Um, smaller floods uh, can allow for the same level of incision into the basalt. So I'll leave it there. Wow, great. Thanks so much, Nigel, for sharing your, your knowledge and, and talented presenting. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm blown away. And I, now I want to go out there and uh, look at the land again and imagine this, this story taking place. Um, Dave, uh, you want to bring us home now? Sure, yeah. I want to echo my thanks to you, Nigel, for uh, sharing your insights and um, there's a lot there. Uh, it's it was it's effective to uh, to spend time together in this manner, and uh, I think we can all imagine um, what it would be like to be together in person out on the land, hearing these stories as well. So um, it, this isn't uh, this is this is this is what we got for the time being. <laughs> um, 
I just wanted to take a few moments to, um, to, to reiterate a couple things that were said earlier. Uh, Todd mentioned that we as a staff have, uh, have started a new practice of, of practicing um, a contemplative uh, nature meditation. We've, we've found sit spots in our neighborhoods and are uh, enjoying uh, finding some time to sit and think and observe and then share with each other uh, what that experience is like. And we did so at our staff meeting just today. And um, like Lena expressed, I, so I started my morning off with a walk down the hill from our house. I, I'm lucky enough to live in the Glenrose neighborhood and my property borders the Morningstar Boys Ranch, which is a large cultivated uh, canola field this year, but it's rimmed with um, creek and forest, mixed deciduous and um, evergreen forest. And today I walked down into this beautiful uh, aspen grove um, that's surrounded by cottonwoods and then, and then uh, ponderosa pine further out. And in the morning light, it was just a glorious place to spend uh, 20 minutes just sitting and um, noticing the day awaken. And um, what I found was that it was, it provided um, a much needed refresh and a sense of restoration, a restoration of purpose, of connection to the work that we do and the reasons why we do it. And it was a real joy today in our staff meeting to go around the table and hear others express those same kinds of thoughts. And I imagine that during this time of uh, shelter in place and pandemic response that maybe you found similar opportunities to connect with places that you love. Um, and I sure hope that's the case. And um, so to the extent that uh, the work that we're doing resonates with you personally and the idea of the restorative powers of our natural world and the desire to share those with others resonates with you, um, I just want to remind you that, uh, that we are um, really fortunate to um, do our work because of the generosity of our donors, people like you gathered here. And, um, and so today is Giving Tuesday. It's a big, it's a give big day in Washington and there's a few hours left in the day. And so if, if, if you find the work that we're doing, especially compelling in the context of um, this time, I would invite you to consider going to our website to uh, make a contribution um, as part of Giving Tuesday. And we're so grateful to you for all the ways that you support us, uh, not only financially, but with your time and your talent. We have um, incredible volunteers who help us um, do the work that we do every day and grow our organization's impact. And so thank you to all of you for all those ways in which you give to support regional conservation.